Hi everyone, welcome to our first Early Math Fall Forum. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Naomi Reilly, a team member of the Early Math Project. We are so excited to have you all here with us tonight. As some of you may know, we are trying something new this fall and hosting the shortened math event. We would like to see if people would be interested in attending a couple of shorter math events in addition to our longer summer symposium. We welcome your feedback on whether this would be of interest to you. Hello everyone, my name is McKenna Huey. I am another member of the Early Math Project team. In the presentation this evening, there will be six breakout sessions to choose from, and these include problems in the transitional kindergarten classroom, what to do and what not to do. Tinkering in early childhood. Show and tell great graphs and smart charts. Bringing early math to libraries, resources and programs to support families with five. Intentional lessons, universal design for learning. And supporting preschool through third grade instructional alignment. Now, you may have difficulty choosing between um, these different breakout sessions, but not to worry. Luckily, all of the presentations will be recorded and archived, so you'll be able to listen to anything that you missed. Hello, everyone. I'm Dana McVeigh. And as Naomi mentioned, we would really like to know whether people would like the Early Math Project to organize shorter forms throughout the year. We would really appreciate your feedback at the end of the evening. So please just take a few minutes or two to fill out the very short uh, survey at the end of the event. It's just four questions, that's all. And I'll want a certificate of participation for attending tonight. And the directions for getting that certificate of participation are provided at the end of the survey. So I'll be back to remind you about all of that at the end. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Haley Gordon. Um, many of you will receive a copy of Stuart J. Murphy's new book, Show and Tell, Great Graphs and Smart Charts. Stuart donated 75 copies of his book, and we have several hundred more to give away in addition. If you want to be entered into the drawing for the book, please share your mailing address. We won't share your mailing address, nor will we use it for any other purpose than to mail you a book if you're one of the lucky winners. If you've been attending the Early Math Project events over the years, you know that we like to give away lots of books. We think you'll like this fun and colorful introduction to infographics. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Pfister. I'm excited to share information about the 20, 000, or 2023 Young Mathematical Story Author Competition. It's an annual international math story picture book writing contest. It's actually two contests. The first is the Stuart J. Murphy Award for children who are eight to 11 years old. The second is the Cindy Neuschwander Award for children who are 12 to 15 years old. Submissions for the uh, story competition um, can be turned in from January 9th, 2023 through March 31st, 2023. And if you are interested in having more information about this, uh, there is a uh, link at the bottom of the screen that will give you some information. You might want to copy it down. The winners for this will receive 100 pounds for themselves and 100 pounds for their school. Kind of a fun um, math uh, exercise figuring out what the conversion rate is. Thank you. Hi everyone, we're so glad that you're all here. My name's Heather McClellan Brandusa. Um, before McKenna introduces our keynote, I'd like to share the Early Math Project website address with you all. It's www.earlymathca.org. Um, and I invite you to visit the site. There are many free resources on this site, book guides, games, songs, activities, information on hosting your own community math event, links to the I'm Ready video series, and much more. Um, when you visit the Early Math Project website, you'll find lots of resources under the Books, Activities, and Videos tab. 
quite a few of the resources focus on children's literature. The Early Math Project team continually looks for books that support children's mathematical thinking and understanding. We prioritize developing materials for books that feature human characters that allow children and families to see others who are representative of themselves within the pages of the book. And there, um, we look for books that are available in multiple languages. This guide on your screen um, and original activity is for a newly released book, Leaves to My Knees, written by Ellen Mayer and illustrated uh, by Nicole Tagel and published by Starbright Books. The book, the book guide, and the activities all support children's understanding of comparisons and informal measurement. I'd also like to encourage you to visit the countplayexplore.org site, which has been developed through the California Statewide Early Math Initiative. It's also full of fun and playful ideas for enjoying math with your child or the children you work with. All right. And now I am thrilled to introduce our keynote. Um, from El Sol Science and Arts Academy, we have Jenny Zavala, Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Monique Davis, Executive Director, and Yvette Gonzalez, Program Specialist. They are joined by Andres Bustamante, who is an Assistant Professor at the University of California, Irvine School of Education, as well as the Director of the Social, Iterative, Engaged, and Meaningful, or STEM, Learning Lab. Their keynote on taking learning outside, creating playful learning landscapes will show you how they've created research-based playful learning landscapes on the ELSO campus and how you can too. They hope you're ready to play. Am I on? Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, we are so pleased to be here. Thank you to the California Early Math Project for inviting us to share our work related to math and playful learning landscapes. Uh, here's a disclaimer about this session. We have this group, our group has done this session before at a conference and it was uh, wildly fun and we really enjoyed it and we're looking forward to replicating it, but we have not done it in a virtual setting. So we know it's six o'clock. Uh, we appreciate that you're here and we want this to be fun. So we're gonna give it a try and, and uh, uh, keep your fingers crossed. Our presentation will provide the history of our project, the research driven evidence, the administrative organization, and finally a bit of play. Uh, I do wanna note there were some pre-instructions. So uh, I, I have my basket and my paper that I'm going to crumple and the other materials that we'll need, we'll need, and Andres will talk about that in a bit. Um, let's start by learning something about El Sol. El Sol Science and Arts Academy is a preschool through eighth grade public charter school located in Santa Ana. Santa Ana sits in the center of Orange County and its residents are primarily hardworking immigrants, predominantly Latino. It is a city with significant housing density and with real economic constraints. With 1,000 students, El Sol provides a dual immersion instructional program beginning with our three-year-old students and continuing through their eighth grade year. We are community school with a robust school-based pantry, the El Sol Mercado, Mercado El Sol, an on-site federally qualified health center, the SOS El Sol Wellness Center, and a long list of valuable um, community partners. One of those valuable partners is the University of California, Irvine. In fact, we are an OCEAN, Orange County Educational Advancement Network partner school of the UCI School of Education. And it is in this context that we share our work with you today. Um, before I pass you off to Andres, I want to pre-interject because he's gonna provide you the history of the project, but I'd like to interject beforehand to say that the development of this project was pre-COVID. But as all good projects do, it aligned wonderfully with an unknown challenge. And in this case, it was COVID. Um, and outside then was just the even more perfect place to learn. As a result, El Sol did receive a pivotal practice recognition from the California Department of Education for our implementation of this in our hubs 
and during our hybrid learning. So lucky we had this one day. Uh, with that introduction, I'd like to pass this off to Andre. Wonderful, thank you, Monique, uh, uh, for, for setting us up. And yeah, I wanna echo Monique's sentiment. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, after hours. Um, we know what it's like uh, to be a early childhood teacher and uh, you know, the days can be long and uh, they're very rewarding. So I wanna start off by telling you a little story. Uh, and the story is a collaboration um, between uh, the University of California, Irvine, uh, STEM Learning Lab, my lab, and, and El Sol Academy, um, like Monique mentioned. Um, and so we started off uh, essentially um, uh, I went. I came to El Sol and I met with Monique because I had a couple ideas of how we could bring some play and learning opportunities to the El Sol playground and to the schoolyard uh, because the research is so clear uh, that children learn best through play. And it doesn't matter, actually. I think early childhood's a, a, a ahead of the game. Uh, even older kids uh, learn best through play. So I came and I met with Monique and I told her about some of these projects that you're seeing pictures of. Uh, this Parkopolis is the life-size board game. Uh, we do uh, puzzles in, in public spaces. And uh, so uh, Monique was very excited and introduced me to uh, some of uh, her math teachers, including Yvette, who's on this call. And I told them about this idea, uh, these ideas of uh, integrating play and learning into the schoolyard. And, you know, as a researcher, I was coming into the meeting thinking, okay, I got these school partners. I'm going to get them really excited. And then maybe we'll apply for a grant. And, you know, usually when you write a grant, you know, it takes, you got to write it and it doesn't get funded. And so, you know, you got to wait about another year and then, and then you, uh, you write it again. And hopefully the second time it gets funded. So in my researcher mind, I'm thinking like two to three year timeline. And um, this is why I love working with teachers. They were like, okay, this is great. Let's start tomorrow. What should we do first? And I was like, oh, okay, tomorrow. That, that's uh that's a good idea. And so, you know, inside I was very scary because I was not anticipating this. But on the outside, I wanted to capitalize on the enthusiasm. And I turned the question right around to them. And I said, OK, well, you know your school. You know your students. Let's start tomorrow. What should we do first? And the teachers told me, hey, well, we just repaved our basketball court, but we haven't painted any lines on it yet. And so from there, we started kind of throwing around ideas. And I also want to uh, give a little um, uh, 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 warning, I guess, that the first example here is, uh, is, is, isn't an early childhood content. It's actually fractions and decimals. So we're talking about fourth and fifth graders, but you'll see it's all very relevant in later examples. We'll go to the early space. But yeah, essentially we came up with this idea called Fraction Ball. And Fraction Ball is a way for kids to learn fractions and decimals while they play basketball. So you can see that the traditional three-point arc on a basketball hoop is converted to a one point line. And then there's smaller arcs closer to the basket that are worth a quarter point, a half a point, three quarters of a point, and then finally a hole. And then the left side of the court, the blue, is in decimal representations. And the right side, the green, is in fraction representations. So this way, kids can see that uh, 0.5 and 1 half are the same value, just written in different notations. Um, and so uh, with this fraction ball court, I wor we worked with the teachers at El Sol to create a couple um, games, essentially like a, a curriculum for kids to uh, learn uh, math, uh, fractions and decimals during PE uh, and math class. And so, um, Jenny, the next slide shows uh, uh, essentially the game has three roles. It has a shooter who takes the shot. It has a rebounder who collects the rebound and calls out the point value. Uh, to the third player who's the counter and they're on a number line on the side of the court. And so we have a, a several uh, games, you know, we have different goals like make as many shots as you can in one minute or each team has a certain preset amount of shots. And so the beginning they're taking whatever shots they want, but at the end they have to be a little bit more strategic because if you're down two and a half points and you only have three shots left, you know, you gotta take some riskier shots, some larger shots to catch up. Um, there's a game called exactly where the teacher calls out uh, an exact number like uh, uh, 3.75. And then, uh, you know, in the beginning, students are taking whatever shots they want. But towards the end, if you're at three and a half and you take a half point shot, you're going to overshoot your goal and you lose automatically. So it's, again, some of this planning and a little more thoughtful, uh, and a little bit of intentionality. And then 
Um, the next slide shows the number line, which is a really critical part of this fraction ball game. Um, uh, there's a lot of research in uh, math learning and math cognition that suggests that the number line is a really powerful tool uh, for children to learn uh, uh, math, and particularly um, uh, magnitude understanding and just seeing that fractions are a whole broken into even parts and uh, you know, being able to have that embodied learning uh, opportunity, walking down the number line, these are really valuable um, learning opportunities for, for students. Uh, and, and it's done in this kind of playful, uh, exciting context. Um, and so uh, as a researcher uh, and in collaboration with, with the teachers at LSO, we've done a couple of studies, a couple of evaluation studies to make sure that these games work. And uh, so what we did is we, um, had students uh, during PE class, we randomly pick half the class to play fraction ball and the other half to do PE business as usual. And then we gave them a, a, a math packet and then had them play fraction ball for three weeks. And then we gave them the same math packet after. And what we found, which is very exciting, that the kids who played fraction ball learned a lot of fractions. So that's what we wanted to happen. And that's what, and that's what we saw. So you can see kids made, uh, you know, the little black dots are the, um, uh, basically showing uh, the gains that the kids who played fraction ball had in comparison to uh, the kids in the control group. Uh, and so this was a very exciting result. We, uh, we, uh, there's a link to the paper if anybody wants the details of this study or, or more details on the game. It's in the hyperlink. I think we're going to share these slides. So this study is published in the Journal of Educational Psychology. Um, and so uh, now we're working with teachers to make a classroom component. Uh, to this fraction ball game that kind of accompanies the game on the court to have that uh, in-class, out-class kind of continuity and, and build on that fun, engaging experience. Um, and so I think next we're going to hear from Jenny uh, about the, uh, the teacher um, uh, setting, setting the culture for, for uh, doing this kind of thing and, and also from the teacher perspective. Uh, yeah, Jenny, you go ahead. All right, perfect. Thank you, Andres. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. So really, I want to touch upon a couple of points. Uh, one, as it relates to a systems-wide level of support uh, in terms of getting the teachers involved, but also um, at the classroom level and a little bit more practical. So for example, in order for this to happen, um, as you can see, the conditions for learning and the conditions for uh, risk-taking and uh, the desire to want to explore new ideas really has to be there. Of course, we're very fortunate we have uh, a teaching community uh, that is not only experienced, but enthusiastic to bring these experiences to the classroom. And so as Andres had alluded to, uh, when the idea was presented, uh, even though this was something that our executive director was really supporting, when the teachers found out uh, that they were able to take part in this, as this, this was something that would allow them to really enhance the learning that was happening in the classroom, there was absolute buy-in. And so uh, the enthusiasm grows uh, when you have uh, an understanding of how teachers can be involved. But additionally, thinking about ways that as administrators or at a, uh, at a school level, um, how do we provide the support so that teachers can be a part of this experience, right? Do we provide uh, release time? Do we allow, um, provide scheduling changes? And so those were some of the things that really helped us uh, to, to accomplish this. Uh, on a more practical level, which is at the classroom level, as I mentioned, uh, teacher buy-in and teacher enthusiasm is really important. So teachers want their students to, to take part in activities that engage them. And so once you have a teacher that is trying it maybe at the classroom level, or maybe you're the teacher that says, hey, this is something that I want to try. Um, and we all know that when there's excitement in one place, uh, most often uh, when we see results and when we see this enthusiasm, you have other teachers uh, that join in. And so uh, again, creating those conditions for teachers to have an opportunity to participate, providing support, but also at the, the ground level, uh, allowing teachers to take risks and uh, seeing the results as students um, are really enjoying. So these are some of the, the quotes that some of the teachers had given, uh, um, had provided with us. So um, most of all, I think it was really the student voice. Um, and so these are just some examples and I'll hand it over to Yvette in just a bit so she can speak more towards um, the progression of how this came about uh, and what were some of the experiences that the, 
the other teachers shared and the feedback from the students, which is also uh, really important. So Yvette, I'll hand it over to you. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry, it was it, I, it was on, but I for some reason couldn't hear. So thank you, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Yvette Gonzalez, and I've been an educator for 19 years, and I've been out of the classroom for five years. But as a teacher, when I was in the classroom, I always looked for outdoor experiences for my students. So when Andres came with this idea, I was one of those teachers. I was like, what, what, when can we start? Let's start tomorrow. And what are our ideas? But Playing the game with the students has been something that as an as a teacher has been very insightful because when the study happened, I didn't have a classroom. I was already a program coordinator. So working with students, I got to see firsthand how students were doing mathematical reasoning while playing a game and supporting each other. And more relevant to number ball, uh, number ball, I got to play last year with some first and second graders. And one of the games uh, I got to play with the students, and I didn't know the students. They came to me, we played the game, I explained the rules, was uh, the plus or minus game where students got to start at different parts of the number line and their goal was either to get to zero or get to the 20. And students were supporting each other, even some students that weren't able to do the math immediately when the shots were being made they were helping each other and say hey you need to go backwards because we're actually subtracting we're not adding or the students were checking each other for um you know for correct making sure that the the computation was correct so it was really exciting to see how students were playing but at the same time learning so as a teacher i just really uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with the with the team to develop and see our basketball courts who are that are colorful. And I know I, we haven't shown a picture of what our number ball looks like, but it's very similar to the fraction ball. The games are slightly different, but the beauty is, of this is that the curriculum is written and it's re really easy to follow. And it's, in, it, there we go, there's a number ball. So they're in whole numbers. And as you can see, the number line goes from uh, zero to 20. And seeing the kids who are the, the counters, the kids who are on the number line, having to pay attention to where they're shooting the ball and calculate the, the number of points they have to move on the number line. And the fact that they do it without, you know, they, they're, they're doing it automatically without me having to, to really tell them to do it. It's, it's really exciting to see, especially because when we're trying to teach some type of computation in the classroom. Sometimes it takes a while for the students to see it, but while they're playing a game, they have no problem uh, doing the math, especially when they have friends to help them uh, do the, the math and check for understanding. The beauty of this game is that after they play the game, they're really short games. We do a lot of um, like team meetings and we talk about what happened in the game. How can we meet the goal of the game depending on the, on the game we were playing? Sometimes we would say, okay, the goal is to get to 20. And if they ended up after, I don't know, 12 shots, they end up at 10. We talk about, well, how many more points did we need to get to get to 20? What was the goal? If we had three extra shots, how could we get to 20? So having the students dialogue and talk about different strategies and what they could try next was really exciting. And the beauty of it is that they would always end with, when are we playing again? So the fact that we had a game and they were learning was just a big plus. So that was just my experience.
Wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing, Yvette. And yeah, um, also thanks for introducing Number Ball. So yeah, I promised that there was going to be some content here for, for the younger kiddos. And so uh, Number Ball we, we've done with for kindergarten, first and second grade. Um, and that hoop is actually a little bit lower than we, we lowered it from when it was in that picture, but it's, you know, at a lower height. And then we throw a big hula hoop over the rim. So kids can just throw the ball through the hula hoop. They got a lot more points being scored, uh, but very similar concept. Uh, there's the shooter who's taking the shots. And instead of just uh, shots being worth two or three, like regular basketball, you can shoot a one, two, three, four, or five point shot. And the kids are again, using that number line, uh, to, to walk down and, and keep track of their score. Um, and I think actually this project um, is a good demonstration about how these concepts and principles of playful learning can be adapted up and down um, grade levels. And so um, the original idea was for uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And this is showing how you can kind of adapt the content to bring it down to uh, K2. And certainly you could adapt it even further and go to pre-K. Uh, maybe you would make it soccer instead of basketball so they can just kick the ball and they don't have to throw it up or, uh, you know, whatever adaptations, but the, the basic premise of kids playing through learning and, uh, and, and moving their bodies and being outside and having fun and then kind of counting their score on a number line, I think is a, a pretty um, generalizable idea. And so uh, we did also did an evaluation study of this number ball uh, a game and it seemed like it was working really well for the kindergartners and it was a little too easy for the second graders. So now we're working with the teachers that all sold to make some adaptations to make it more challenging for the second graders, like throwing in a golden ball that multiplies your score or a red ball that, uh, that subtracts your score or um, giving different kinds of um, power-ups that can make kids add uh, bigger numbers. And so all, there's all types of ways to kind of get creative and Teachers, you all are amazing at, at these kind of adaptations. And so um, this is just sort of a, a home base for you all to take and run with and, you know, make yours and, um, and uh, kind of make it work for your students and, your, and the kids in your, that you're, uh, in your class. Um, uh, one more example that we'll give that's also alive and well at El Sol Academy is Parkopolis, the life-size board game for math and science learning. Um, and so Parkopolis, you could think of it like a giant board game where you're the piece in the game. And um, uh, yeah, there's different zones. Again, uh, you, you roll these dice and you, roll, and you walk around the board and then you pull cards and all the cards have content uh, from early childhood research. So um, there's uh, like you can see on the bottom right, there's a card that has a uh, kind of a magnus uh, comparison, which side is bigger, and then it has like the symbolic representation of numbers as well as the three stars. Um, the next slide, slide shows um, some of the, uh, the games. So there's music pipes for kids to play patterns. We know patterns are a really powerful early math skill. And so the, a card could have, you know, play this pattern, red, blue, red, blue, what comes next? And so kids have to tap the pattern on the music pipes and they make a sound. Um, the shape zone is on the top right. That's for like early geometry, you know, jump on all the squares, jump with your left foot on the triangles and your right foot on the red things. So kind of shape recognition and, and physical activity. There's a giant ruler on the bottom left. Uh, so kids can measure how far they can jump, how tall they are, uh, how far them and their two best friends can reach holding hands. Um, there's a hopscotch game that lets kids um, jump and match the feet. And then we have a game, uh, a card that says, do the opposite. When you see two feet, use one foot. And when you see one, use two. So now they're engaging this higher order thinking skill of inhibition, one of these cognitive skills that we know is really important for kids' development. Uh, and yeah, and the next slide shows some results. So we did, we did a study where we did observations of the kind of language environment happening during Parkopolis. And we saw that kids were using number language, um, spatial words, reasoning, they were talking about patterns, they were asking questions, and so creating this really rich uh, language environment. And the next, the next slide shows actual, like uh, um, a mural that we painted on the floor at, at El Sol uh, for kids to play Parkopolis uh, in, the, in their own schoolyard. And again, we're working with the teachers at El Sol to make uh, kind of curricular games uh, to help teachers accomplish whatever their learning goals are uh, so this is a really flexible platform and you can sub out the cards for whatever the math content 
uh, is that you're working on. And so if it's, you know, cardinality or whatever, whatever your math content is, you throw in the cards and it just makes a kind of fun life-size board game way to, uh, for kids to work and, and develop these skills. Um, and th there's your card decks right there and some kids that also uh, play in Parkopolis. Um, so yeah, it's just some really exciting, uh, uh, innovative ways that, that, uh, that, 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 El Sol is thinking about um, making the schoolyard a kind of a hub for play and learning. Uh, and I think Monique uh, is going to, before we set up a little bit of play here, Monique is going to uh, take us home and then, uh, and then maybe introduce the activity. Um, there is a link and you should be able to, uh, in the chat and you should be able to go to that and, uh, pull the slides up on your own later. Um, so check that out. And, uh, I'm not sure what happened and why the slides didn't come up. Um, I did just sort of as, as, as closing themes that, that I think were words that, that were a part of this really creativity. Uh, adaptability, refinement, and mostly fun. So we want to engage you in that process of fun. We're going to give it a try uh, and try to do it virtually, um, just like all the teachers did uh, during COVID. We'll see if we can pull it off as adults. Um, and then uh, we'll do some question and answers. Uh, so, Andres, you want to set up the courts? Everybody should have their stuff. Yeah, uh, we're going to so model a round of number ball. So each of us has set up our own number ball court at home, and we're each going to we're going to do make it count. So I'm going to say we each get three shots. Uh, we're going to take turns, Monique, then Jenny, then Yvette, then me, and we're going to see who ends up with the most points after – three shots each and that's the make it count game. So I'm gonna spin my computer around. And then after we wanna challenge all of you at home to, uh, to race, well, we'll get there. I don't wanna spoil that, but we'll get there. Let's play our round first to kind of model there. I don't know if folks can see my court. Can you all see my number ball court? Yeah, you can kind of see it. <laughs> There's a little tiny hoop there, if you believe it or not. Uh, Let's see Monique's court. Monique, I don't see your court. Where's your court? Oh, there yeah. it is. Okay, nice. Yeah. Don't don't challenge me too much. I mean, <laughs> so you get the first shot, Monique. You get the first oh, shot. Oh, okay. Yeah. But well, where are you shooting from? You gotta tell us where you're shooting from. So, yeah. One pointer. Okay, nice. <laughs> so Monique has one. Jenny, you're up next. All right. So I actually set up my my line. So I'm gonna start a little close first. Okay. Let's see. Nothing. You miss? Okay, Yvette's turn. I have to get my basket. <laughs> I was okay, all right, my talk. turn. I'll go get my basket. <laughs> my turn. Okay, I'm going to go for the, a two-point shot to see my distance. This is a tiny little hoop, so yeah, I'm going to stand right here in my two-point line. See, see if I can get it. Oh, air ball. All right. <laughs> all right, Monique, you're up. Oh, no, we have oh. to We'll let we'll let Yvette take several shots. Okay. Right. All right. Maybe I'll move back a little bit more. Just okay. Like, two pointer. Oh. <laughs> just missed it. Okay. All I right. So, so far, Monique has one. Jenny has zero. Okay, I'm gonna go all the way back. Let's Whoa, see. High pointer. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna go big. Okay. Like it. I like it. Oh. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, Yvette, you get two shots now because we skipped you the first time. <laughs> <laughs> there go. There's some teacher ingenuity happening right live in front of your eyes. Yvette, we, Yvette, can't we, we can't hear you, but we can we're see. Doing. Take your shot. We're doing number ball, so we're going by numbers, whole numbers. Um, whole numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yep. I'm going to try three, so I'm going to stand over here so you can't. Oh, really nice. See. Okay, okay. We'll see just the end result. You had to get a shopping bag. <laughs> Teachers always find a way. Okay, didn't make it. <laughs> okay, miss. Oh, you get two shots actually, Yvette. Oh, okay, okay. Try another three-pointer. Right now, Monique's got the lead. With oh. one 
with one. I, I didn't make it, so no three-pointer for me. All right, I'm going to make sure I catch him on these. I'm going to take the easiest, closest shot and get my one-pointer. I'm going to stand as close as possible. Yeah, hey. <laughs> All right, I tied Monique. Monique, this is your last shot. You get okay. this is the third and final shot. So okay. decide carefully I'm, what shot do you want to take? Oh, you know, I'm gonna go for two. Nice. That's okay, good. that'll be give you a I'm nice go for lead. The big win. All right. I like it. I like it. Nice, nailed it. <laughs> Monique, how much do you have total? You had one. Now you got have, two. I have one plus two. I have three. Nice. Okay. Monique's got three. Jenny, you're up. Last shot. Okay. I'm not giving up. I'm still going for five. Wait a second. So Jenny, wait, wait, wait a second. Jenny, you yeah. right now have zero. I have zero. That's Monique, right. So Monique has three. I have one. This is your last shot. What shot do you want to take? Um, I, I still want to go for the five. Nice. Okay. Let me right, go. Okay. So there's no Jenny. video evidence of that. I know. Oh, I, I, I think the oh, lines. <laughs> okay. So what score do you have now, Jenny? Pardon me? What do you have? What's your score? I have five. I did. I went all the way back. I did five points. Okay. You had zero and you, you got five and points. Five. Shot, so now you're, you're at five. All right. Monique's three. Jenny's five. Yvette, last shot. What shot okay, are you I'm gonna just gonna say? I'm gonna go safe. I want to tie with Monique, so I'm gonna try another three pointer. <laughs> nice. Okay, you're shooting for not last, and I respect it. <laughs> nice. Oh, did you get it? Did it go in? I was close. I did not make it, no. so I have okay. zero. Points. All right. All right. So now I have one point. Monique has three. So if I wanted to tie Monique, I could take a two pointer. But Jenny has five. Yeah. So in order to tie Jenny. I would need a four pointer and that's pretty far. So I'm going to go for a five pointer for the win. Oh, okay. have, it's a <laughs> risky play. I'm very likely to miss, but I think I'm going to try it. I'm going to be like behind the camera because I'm so far. I'm going to be at my furthest shot. And here we go. Taking the shot. No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jenny is the winner with a one shot. wonderful. Okay, actually, Monique, if I gave you one more shot, uh, what would you take to try to catch up to Jenny? I have three. You have three, and she has five. Another two. Oh, I have to come in a tie. If a I want two to tie. tie. What if you wanted to win? What would you shoot? I need three. Okay. For drama, we're gonna give you one more bonus shot, Monique. Okay, Ooh. here we go. <laughs> three. I'll be outside. You get to shoot anyone you want. All right, let's three. Let's okay. see if she can go for the win here. Oh, 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 oh. the pressure was too much. All right, all right. We kick it to you now, audience. Make your own fraction, your number ball court. First one to get to ten wins, and put it in the chat when you get to ten. First one to get to 10 wins. We're going to have to do honor system because we can't actually <laughs> see your setups. But I would love to see your setups. Take a picture or something and put it on Twitter. Here, let me put my Twitter thing. Bag El Sol Academy and me. First, show us your, your number ball setups and let us know who gets to 10 first. David Max got this. He's he's got ten in the bag. That's only two five point shots potentially. I see some of the comments of um, the explanations that you did, Andres, and that's as a teacher. That's one of the beauties of when you're playing the game. You're trying to tell the students. So what do you want to do to to either tie or win the game? And then they huddle and they strategize and. The, the beauty of the game is that everybody gets to be a shooter. There's some shooters that are more accurate than others. And so sometimes it's kind of luck of the draw whenever it's your time to shoot and you want to tie the game. A lot of the times they'll, they'll say, oh, can so-and-so shoot instead for me? I'm like, uh -huh. no, we can all shoot. And, but we have to strategize the game because if you only get three shots, how are you going to do it? So it's a lot of strategy involved in the games and it depends on the game you play, but it's really exciting to see how the students strategize. Yeah, I see some people talking about how you can adapt. So definitely can be adapted uh, to every age group. Wonderful. Somebody playing in bed. I love it. 
Michelle Palazzo got 12 points. She blew right by I don't know what you're goal. doing out there, Michelle. I think we got a winner here. I think we got a winner here. Somebody got three. Okay. We got Rochelle got 10. Awesome. Who else got it? Okay. Two shots at two point each. So t- okay. Fernanda, <laughs> Fernanda got four. Maria got three. Erica got 10. Look at y'all go. <laughs> Perla, you're getting negative numbers. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> That's another way to That's go. That's advanced. Oh, That's advanced. advanced. Every yeah. time you don't make a shot, right? You're going back. <laughs> I like it. They're like playing it. the plus or minus game, I think. Yeah, that it was one of the games we did. We one did the games. we had a red ball for for um for minus points and we started them at 10. And one team had to get the if if one team got to 20, they won and then if the red team got to 0, they won. So that was a that was a So they had game. to start in the middle and work opposites. Yeah. Oh, 256. Holy moly, <laughs> JB. <laughs> <laughs> JB went crazy. I don't, I, I want to see JB's court. I don't know. That seems like uh <laughs> must have a that, That's this there. court. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. A lot of dunking. Awesome. Awesome. I don't know, Andres, do you have a picture of the way the basketball had the hula hoop around? Because I think that's very important for the primary grades. Because Yeah, I don't. I didn't have a picture, but basically we took a hula hoop and threw it over the top so the kids could just throw it right through the hula hoop. They didn't have to make the basket. And just to add, um, when I played this game with the first graders, uh, they really wanted to throw it into the real basketball, not the hula hoop. So I just kind of added like bonus points if you can actually yeah. make it into the real basketball hoop. And... They all tried, but you know, it was so large enough. It was large enough so that the students could still make it into the hoop. So they would attempt to throw it into the basketball hoop for like an extra bonus point. But um, if they didn't, at least it would still fall within the regular um, point. So it was exciting to see that the students were still trying to aim to the big basket, the basketball hoop. Yeah, that was awesome. They got double points for making it in the in the real hoop. I- I think what we really want you all to know is that um, even though we're all having fun here, whether we're making baskets uh, from our beds or, or wherever we are right now, um, we still have the research evidence that there is real learning going on and our brains are turned on and, and um, excited. And, and we want to share that and make sure that uh, you all go away really feeling good about your own creativity and and the, your own refinement of what's possible as as we all have fun doing uh learning these skills and building them as foundational pieces in their early childhood development and as our students move up here at el sol um and more complex um uh math learning needs to take place yeah, middle schoolers can do probabilities, and there's there's always something you can do. Uh, uh, I, I think actually I'm going to de- declare Yolande the winner because um, they had students, they had students playing, and of course, oh, okay, all right, that's, that's, a, that's a big winner. <laughs> uh, and and we, I I missed most of the time. <laughs> uh, me too, Patricia. Um, I. I, I also want to point out when when Andres first posted the the work of the fraction ball, we did get some attention from folks who use probability and analytics for sports, and uh, it it went a little bit viral. and And this is really just to sort of also highlight that this is fun and this is math, but this is also a career, and uh, being able to engage in the sports environment and think about math and understand how it applies in different ways turns out to be something not just exciting for early learners and middle schoolers, but for adults who are doing um, sports analytics out in the out in the world. Yeah, excellent. I, I think we have a couple minutes for a Q&A. If anybody has questions, we'd love to hear from you. And, and uh, try please use the Q&A feature instead of the chat because it's much easier for us to keep track of the questions that way. Um, but yeah, if anybody has questions, please do drop them in the Q&A feature. We'd love to have have this be a bit conversational.
Um, somebody asked about um, using it at uh, math, family math night. That's a good idea. That's a really good idea. So actually, I can speak to that because when we had our um, uh, modified, um, what is it, open house, uh, uh, we decided to shift a little bit. And so we turned it into an interactive open house where instead of coming and walking around and looking at projects, you actually would go around and you would play some of these games. So we had somebody stationed at the Parkopolis uh, place and then we actually had stuff happening in the classrooms. Um, and so I think that's a, a great idea, especially if you have the little ones actually showing their parents, right? They explain the rules, they build language. And so that's a really great uh, idea, different ways to showcase this. Um, so there, there's also a question on funding. We did receive uh, some grant funding from uh, some private donors, uh, uh, foundation donors. Those are not difficult applications. Um, and we, it was a, a local family foundation and uh, in this case, the Swain Family Foundation and they provided the funding for the, the painting and and the pieces that that went along with this work so um it 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 could also be a fundraising effort through your pto or something like that we happen to use uh, a, a local family foundation um for adaptability for toddlers uh anybody have some ideas about how you might use this in a in a daycare home setting So I saw earlier that somebody was um, using the idea of a bean bag, right? Um, so that's another way. Bean bags are really, in terms of like developmental motor skills, that's another way uh, to adapt. Uh, maybe a little bit more direction with uh, the adults. Maybe doing a side by side. Um, so just maybe thinking about using different tools or different. Uh, if they don't have the motor skills for a ball per se, um, maybe you can jump. Uh, you can come up with different ways. Uh, to use the body uh, in this in this type of activity. Yeah, and I see a couple of people asking about preschoolers as well. I know <clears throat> I've seen it's very common in preschools, the, the very short basketball hoop that's on like a stand, has like a circle around it, and then it's just the hoop in the middle, and it's probably two or three feet tall. And so um, the kids can just go up and pop the ball right in. But maybe you could have that. It's, you know, it's like a full circle. So maybe you can have like concentric circles around it, like a ring. And then have them. The further they way away they get from the the hoop in the middle, the more points they can get. And I think the same the number line uh, concept um, holds for early childhood as well. It's a, a really common tool, uh, powerful tool for kids to kind of walk down the number line and be able to count out their scores. And even for number identification and um, you recon yeah recognizing what the numbers are, which ones are bigger, because so they can see further down the number line it's a bigger number. And, um, I think a lot of this stuff could really be applied in, in early childhood. So, Andres, people are asking about Metropolis. You might want to talk a little bit about the um, uh, with Philadelphia kids. Yeah, let me drop the playful learning landscapes. Uh, uh, learning landscapes. So, this work. That uh, fun, I think it is. I'm just trying to drop the website. There it is. So this work is all part of a larger initiative called Playful Learning Landscapes. And um, it is uh, thinking about how we design not only schoolyard spaces, but public and everyday spaces to have these play and learning opportunities. And so if you go to that website that I just dropped in the chat, playfullearninglandscapes.fun, you can see a play, you, there's a playbook on there that has all types of ideas um, for kind of uh, play and learning opportunities that you could do at a bus stop or a grocery store or at a playground or in the schoolyard. And Parkopolis is one of the many ideas on there. Um, it's not for sale per se, it's more of a community-based effort. And so if you're wanting to um, advocate and organize and get something like this in your park, your local park, I suggest reaching out. Uh, you can contact me and I'll put you, I'll connect you with the right people, uh, uh, but you can reach out to the contact on that website and uh, Playful Learning Landscapes has a whole organization that's meant to connect uh, communities with 
um, ideas and, and work with them to get funding to do these kind of projects. Um, but then of course, like these things, you know, funding is always nice and it can make a big, beautiful thing, but like you can do this with chalk or buy a, bu a bucket of paint and get some family volunteers and get out there and start painting. And so, um, you know, I think this, this, this kind of stuff, like Monique said, is, is ripe for, for funding and grant writing opportunities, but also you can make it happen with, you know, uh, with, you know, with a little bit of elbow grease and a bucket of paint, you'd be surprised you can do a lot. <laughs> and 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 this work has is being replicated in other sites and and through other school districts and so there'll be more uh outcome evidence um as as other as the the project expands to other places um and so i'm sure that that andres will continue to write about that and you'll be able to um contact him and find out more. I see Stephanie Collins. Oh, somebody, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know if the names are supposed to be there. But somebody's going to try with their preschool class with soccer, and I'm so interested. Please let me know how it goes. Uh, that That's going to, that's one of my next, my next goals is to do a soccer version. Uh, I think it would be really fun. I also saw a question about not having a lot of space. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you do this in a small space? You have to visit also. We have no space. <laughs> Our space is very limited compared to a regular elementary school. So like Andres said, just draw out chalk. Even before we had fraction ball, when I used to do PE with my students, I used to just put buckets, bean bags, and just draw lines, and they would toss for points. Um, of course, fraction ball and number ball with the curriculum and all the extra um, support made, made games a lot more engaging, but the chalk, basket, bean bags. I think you can do it in any any space, even in classroom rainy days, you can just set up a, a space in your classroom. Yeah, and I see, I've seen a couple questions, uh, one about social emotional learning and one about preschoolers getting frustrated. And I think part of the beauty of play is that um, the, it, 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 it brings together all types of learning opportunities, including social emotional learning. And so dealing with that frustration of wanting to make a basket or kick the ball through the you know through the goal and get your points and 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 struggling with it i think brings it's like it can be a productive struggle um and then of course there's ways to adapt the games to make them developmentally appropriate so that there's a possibility of the kids um you know having some success but um it, it really does bring a lot of learning opportunities for kids to kind of regulate and deal with frustration and also share and take turns um, also, uh, we've done a couple iterations where instead of, uh, one team versus the other team, where we try to implement like a collective goal, like can the whole class get to 20 points overall? And then there's some kind of reward for that. And so you can kind of balance between, um, competitive goals where maybe you're introducing some more tolerance for frustration versus collective goals where you have kids really supporting each other and cheering each other on because, you know, you did your points, but for the, for you to get to the class goal, the next person's got to make their points. And so um, it's really um, can be beautiful to see how kids support each other. And um, some games like for the fraction ball and the number ball, some kids really lend themselves to the math and that comes easy to them. And other kids really are good, better at the basketball and at the shooting. And you see the, the kids who have that strength in math really supporting their classmates who are on the number line, whereas the kids who have that skill in basketball will be giving their teammates pointers about bend your knees or throw it against the backboard or, you know, so um, it really, I think, is a really rich social emotional learning environment. And I think that comes with a lot of play uh, context. Um, so that's something that I really love about uh, some of these games, too. So our, our time is, is coming quickly towards the end. We so much appreciate that you um, engaged in this with us. I think we were a little nervous about whether or not we'd be able to make it fun. Um, so I, I'm glad you, you went there with us and, and, and went for it. I did see somebody had a question about touring El Sol. We're more than welcome to have visitors all the time. Uh, we do have a, a group that, of educators who come uh, for learning every year from the, the Netherlands. They'll be here on Monday. And a couple years ago when, well, not COVID, but whenever last the last time, when, 
um, we did it uh, with them on our on the real fraction ball court, and they took that back to the Netherlands. And it's just a fun way to learn, no matter where you live, and 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 no matter how you approach teaching, and no matter what language you speak. Um, but but uh, so we're we hope you try it in all the creative ways that that you know how, and um, and you're more than welcome to come and visit us at any time. Naomi, we're sharing like contact information and uh, all that kind of stuff for if folks have questions to reach out. Is that right? Great. Yeah, you can definitely put that in the chat and then we can also send out an email with all your contact information, your presentation slides so everyone can see those couple of slides that we're missing um, from view. Um, and we'll, we'll get make sure everyone gets access to all of that. Awesome. Just really quick so everyone can see, I'm going to share my screen. We have, I think I am lagging a little bit. I hope everyone can hear me, but we have six great breakout sessions coming up. Um, we'll have a quick five minute break and then starting at 7.05, um, you, are, you are able to pick which breakout session you would like to attend. Um, on the left hand side of your screen, there's that blue menu. All you need to click is the breakout session tab. It will navigate you to look at these six wonderful breakout sessions, and you get to pick which one you would like to join um, by clicking that blue join button next to it. Um, they will start at 7.05. They will also all be recorded. So after the event, you'll have access to the recordings. And so whichever one you're not able to attend tonight because you decide to attend one, a different one, you, you will be able to see it. So. Um, just remember that you'll have access to all the recordings. Um, again, that is on the left-hand side, navigating to breakout sessions. You will see them all um, with their descriptions and titles on that page once you navigate to it. Um, and then you can join that session by clicking the join blue button. Hey, we'll see you at 7.05 in one of the breakout sessions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again. This was fun. Bye. Bye, Linda.